Anthem. You all know the name. Hey. How many times have we heard there's a Destiny killer on the horizon? One that'll finally become more popular than Bungie's looter shooter Juggernaut. Most of the time, they come to nothing. But before Anthem's release, things seemed different. I can't even begin to express how much hype there was about this game when it was revealed. A project helmed by the legendary Bioware, famous for games such as KOTOR, Dragon Age Origins, and Mass Effect, set in a completely new, interesting universe. How could anyone not get excited over a game like this? Well, we all remember what happened with Mass Effect Andromeda, which released just a couple of years before Anthem did. Safe to say, the release of a good game doesn't result in a cascade of poor reviews and hundreds of thousands of frustrated gamers. Surely the same thing wouldn't happen with Anthem, right? Bioware could not mess this up. EA needed this to break into another genre. Well, you're about to find this out. This is the history of the ultimate Destiny killer, the story of Anthem, and the Anthem we never got. I should mention that in 2024, I am trying to break the leash of only covering Destiny on this channel. And since we know how YouTube can be, make sure to subscribe with the bell notifications on so you don't miss videos like this one. Hey, if you hate this video, then you don't have to. But for people who like this content, please make sure you're tapped in. Anthem underperformed when it was released in January 2019. EA expected the game to sell between 5 and 6 million units by the end of March 2019, but it didn't meet those expectations. Initial reviews were mixed. Some fans praised the combat and the visuals, but were confused by a poor story and didn't like the grind combined with network issues that plagued the game in its early stages. How come a team-up between one of the best studios in the industry and one of the biggest and richest publishers out there results in this. Well, it has a lot to do with severe issues during development and a release that was definitely too early for the health of the game. It all started almost 10 years ago, in August 2014. Have you ever heard of a series called Mass Effect? It's kind of small, indie vibes. Not many people know about it. Maybe you've heard the name Shepard before. Maybe not. It's not like it's one of the most popular and critically acclaimed franchises of all time. So, in August of 2014, the executive producer of the original Mass Effect trilogy, Casey Hudson, left Bioware because he thought that the rest of his team would be fine without him. That was kind of a mistake, but also a compliment to Hudson, because it seemed that he was doing a really good job. Development struggled a bit without him. Things got a little worse when, in early 2015, the lead writer of Dragon Age, David Guider, was assigned to the Anthem team. Now this guy was absolutely no slouch. If any of you are fans of HK-47 from Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, you have to say a big thank you to David Guider, and he worked on so many of Bioware's most popular games. However, when it came to Anthem, there was a misfire of sorts. Guider changed the story to make it closer to the cadence of Mass Effect and Dragon Age. But this was an issue for developers who were frustrated that it seemed too similar to what they had already put out. And because it forced them to suddenly change the sorts of things that they had been doing previously. Things got even worse in early 2016, when Guider left Bioware and the story went closer towards what it had resembled before but it was still not entirely coherent. Apparently, this is where things all begin to go wrong, because of leadership. No, I promise you this video isn't about Bungie, I know what you're thinking, but yeah, Bioware had a lot of issues because of indecision and mismanagement from the higher ups. This was also made worse because of the issues surrounding Mass Effect Andromeda. This was a project that was soon to release, but needed more than a miracle in order to be saved. And as a result of this, members of Bioware were instructed to stop working on Anthem temporarily so that they could attempt to help the sinking, or, well, crashing, ship that was Mass Effect Andromeda. 
This was combined with the difficulties that arose from using the Frostbite engine. In Jason Schreier's article for Kotaku, he efficiently explains just how much of a headache Frostbite for Bioware really was. Quote, Frostbite is full of razor blades. One former Bioware employee told a few weeks ago, aptly summing up the feelings of perhaps hundreds of game developers who have worked at EA over the past few years. For those of you who don't know, Frostbite is a game engine created by DICE, the guys behind Battlefield, aka one of the best FPS franchises in all of gaming. 2042 doesn't exist. Don't know what you're talking about. EA wanted all of its studios to use the same engine for their games to save money and time, but there were really big issues for Bioware devs when they tried using Frostbite to implement their ideas. To make matters worse, several Bioware devs who were already familiar with Frostbite had been moved to work on the latest FIFA, EA's biggest moneymaker and flagship franchise. Speaking of EA and money, apparently according to Jason Schreier of the Kotaku article, Bioware didn't often receive the support it needed from EA's Frostbite support team, because RPGs didn't make nearly enough money for EA to really care. Ultimately, the Bioware devs had to cut out a lot of features from Anthem that they had originally wanted in the game, such as crafting and survival. Ironically, when Anthem was first revealed and released, many people labeled it the fabled Destiny Killer, a game to finally end Bungie's hold over the looter shooter genre. However, during the development at Bioware, mentioning Destiny in conversation or making comparisons between Anthem and Destiny was not a good thing. In the Kotaku article, Schreier states that a few people worked on the game said that they were trying to make comparisons to Destiny and that would elicit negative reactions from studio leadership. We were told quite definitively, this isn't Destiny, said one developer. But it kind of is. What you're describing is beginning to go into that realm. They didn't want to make those correlations, but at the same time, when you're talking about fire teams and going off and doing raids together, about gun combat, spells, things like that, there's a lot of elements there that correlate, that cross over. Now, a personal anecdote here. I have content creator friends who are mainly Destiny creators. They spoke on Anthem and how they were asked from the Destiny space to give feedback to Bioware on what to implement in the final game to win the Destiny audience over, just for all of their feedback to go into a trash can. So we have a Destiny killer that wasn't actually meant to be anything like Destiny. Plagued with development issues, unclear decisions from leadership, it seemed that virtually everything went wrong during the development of this game. It was so bad that Anthem was still in pre-production when it was announced at E3 in 2017. One of the biggest issues aside from rush development and crunch was the fact that most of the higher-ups, if not all of them, had no real idea of what sort of a game Anthem should even be. Bioware was traditionally known for making games that had deep, intriguing narratives, with powerful stories designed to compel the player into finding out how their journey would end. Undoubtedly, it must have been difficult for developers who had experience creating story-driven RPGs to shift focus onto an online shooter in the same vein as Destiny. In all honesty, we can see this same sort of thing happening throughout the industry. There are multiple cases of studios that are great at making one kind of game, deciding to create games in genres they are unfamiliar with, usually because their higher-ups have decided to cash in on trends. The biggest recent example of this is the situation with Lord of the Rings Gollum game, where developers who were used to making point-and-click action-adventure games were suddenly being told to create a AAA game with a fraction of the budget. It's already difficult enough to specialize in a certain type of game, like RPGs, and make phenomenal, well-loved hits like Mass Effect and Dragon Age. It's even more difficult to swap genres and make a completely different kind of game to the same level as your previous projects. However, it's no surprise that Anthem had as many issues as it did in development. Just look at this tweet from Ian Saderdallen, one of Bioware's developers who worked on the game. Quote, I learned a lot on this project. We knew it wasn't ready, as this game was literally created in 15 months, which is unheard of for a game of that scope. Anthem 2 
would have been great. This says it all, really. If Bioware couldn't develop Anthem in that short of a space of time, safe to say nobody would have been able to. It's no surprise then that as Anthem launched, the story just kept getting worse. This video is sponsored by Enlisted. You are enlisted to join freelancers of a squad-based first-person shooter now available for free on PC and consoles that skillfully combines PvP with PvE combat. That's right, Enlisted is free and a war on all fronts of whichever you choose. You might be playing the prequel elements of Anthem. No, that's a joke. But you can be who you want to be on the battlefield. Construct fortifications, machine gun nests, or anti-tank guns as an engineer. Call in artillery or massive carpet bomber strikes as a radio operator. Or keep your own soldiers alive as a medic. You guys know I'm a big fan of history, and while Enlisted is a game first, it is still authentic to history. The playable squads, appearances, weapons, and vehicles are all authentic representations of their historical counterparts. Look guys, I'm going to keep it short. Enlisted is free to play. It's available on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. If you use my link in the description, you can even get the special bonus pack available for new PC players that sign up only using my link. You get a helmet, you get a rifle, a sidearm, 4,000 silver, and three days of premium account access directly. This is a limited time link, so make sure you guys go quick or you won't be enlisted. Thank you to Enlisted for sponsoring this video, and now, back to Anthem. So, Anthem. This is a game that started with a promising idea, but was plagued with the kind of development issues that make Destiny 1's troubled story rewrite look like the easiest job a dev can do. Unfortunately, things only got more difficult as the game launched in 2019. Before we cover this ill-fated launch, though, there's something important that we need to mention first. In 2017, a guy called Mark Dara was brought in as the executive producer of Anthem. To be honest, think of him like a surgeon performing life-saving surgery at the very last second. Not to discredit the hard work of all the developers who put tons of energy into Anthem, but it is safe to say that if not for Dara, Anthem might not have existed in 2019. What Dara did was essentially give the team's direction in a way that they hadn't received before. It's always going to be easier to do your job properly when your management is giving you clear instructions and laying down proper expectations that allow you to work on exactly how much you need to do. That being said though, it was obviously still virtually impossible to try to fix everything that had been broken during the troubling years of Anthem's development. There were still many parts of the game that really suffered up until launch, with story and level design being some of the ones that struggled the most. This is all on top of the fact that the developers knew they really didn't have enough time to properly sort out all of the flaws within the game, as well as the numerous server issues that existed throughout the final year of development, which meant that sometimes developers couldn't even log on to test for bugs, even just months before launch really major things were still being fine-tuned, and in some cases, straight up added to the game. For those of you who haven't played Anthem regularly, yes, that's right, all 12 of you, you might be shocked to realize that the launch bay was only added into the game in the very final stages of development. For those of you who are unaware, this was a social space like the Tower in Destiny, where players could show off their cosmetic items to other players. Yeah, this was only added in at the last minute. I want to be clear though, this was not because the developers didn't realize this would be necessary for an online shooter, nor was it because they did, because they had to. They just completely ran out of time. Imagine trying to cook a three course meal for seven people in a quarter of the amount of time it usually takes. Impossible, right? The situation got even worse for Bioware because they had to release Anthem at quite possibly the worst time ever. Because of just how well Bungie and Destiny were doing at the same time. Anthem came out in February of 2019, but we gotta remember that Bungie split from Activision just one month before, and coming off of a monumental community puzzle called Niobe Labs. 
Now, this was at the time where we all thought Activision was the problem, and at the same time, Forsaken had been out for 6 months and it was phenomenal, as most of you are aware. Both of these things ensured that everyone was super hyped for the future of Destiny, so most people didn't want to put Destiny down and pick up a new looter shooter game. It just makes you think, had Anthem released now, after Lightfall's mediocre year of content, it's not too absurd to assume that a lot of people would be much more willing to stick it out and see whether the devs could improve their game with time. We've seen it happen with other games since, No Man's Sky and Cyberpunk being the best examples. However, Anthem never got that chance. While the developers did as much as they could, when the launch came around, Anthem's fate arrived exactly as you'd imagine. In short, it was bad. Really, really bad. Just look at some of the reviews from February of 2019. It's meh best. I really, really wanted to like this game. Resident Evil 2 and Red Dead 2 spoiled me too much. Some good particle effects, huge loading times, cluttered UI, generic enemies, meh story and characters. <laughs> I taunted everything. Yeah, they're just kind of fumbling around, like what? You know, this actually reminds me of Andromeda. Oh shit, <laughs> okay, now they're fucking. This other review would say the story is cliche and downright boring. Combat is nothing new, weapons are bland, and of course, the game is unoptimized garbage that will constantly stop working while playing or downright kick you for server issues or said optimization issues. I, since this is EA and this is a big, big company, I expect nothing but perfection in two minutes and 31 seconds. I, it's, it's just gonna, it's just gonna immediately come up. Everything's gonna be fine. No problems, bug free, perfect gaming experience. Um, I expect absolutely nothing less from a multi bajillion dollar company. And I think you're all with me, aren't you? Another one would say, a lot of games are hard to review. Anthem isn't one of them. Excellent graphical fidelity and wonderful flight mechanics. The narrative is a botched attempt at a traditional Bioware story. This isn't helped by banal environments, which consist of forest ruin after forest ruin, non-stop over and over again. Interrupted massive load times. As everyone suspected before, this is Destiny Light. Let's focus on that last one for a second. I think despite how overwhelmingly negative it is, it identifies the issues with the game in a way that completely corroborates everything the developers were going through. If they just had a little more time, they could have made something really special. But they needed to release the game before EA's fiscal year ended in March 2019. They just didn't have enough time to iron out the flaws that were blindingly clear to players at launch. Of course, these are Metacritic user reviews, so you gotta take them with a pinch of salt. Well, more like a bathtub of salt, but you get the point. They're not necessarily indicative of the way that everyone felt about the game at launch, but they're still informative all the same. When I was scrolling through the Metacritic user reviews, there were hundreds of negative reviews, but there were a lot of positive ones and singled out the beauty behind the dirt. A really surprising amount of people were adamant that Anthem was a wonderful game to play if you did your best to get past the optimization issues and some dodgy gameplay elements. I'm bringing up these reviews because it's clear that with enough love and time, Anthem could have been saved. Something else that helped doom Anthem from the get-go was the developers banning my friend and content creator, Mr. Glad. Uh, and then I got on today and I was like, I told my whole stream on uh, while I was streaming Destiny and I told them the previous day and I told Twitter, I said, listen, I'm going to be playing. I'm going to try to get a couple solid days of Anthem in. I'm excited. I want to get some gear. I was, ex I'm really, uh, I think the game has a lot of potential and I think the devs have shown a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of potential as well because they're really listening to feedback and they're fixing things quickly and they seem to be on top of their shit. But this particular incident is a little strange to me. Nope not temporarily, permanently banning him from playing the game. 
I'm gonna assume most of you know who Glad is, but for those who are unaware of the situation, I'm going to assume that some of you guys don't know who Glad is. Glad was actively in the Destiny community for a long time. He also has multiple world's first races in Destiny, and was one of the largest Destiny streamers going into Anthem's release. However, he was much more important for the Anthem community because he was like the main streamer covering Anthem. He was certainly one of the most popular and influential ones, other than yours truly, of course. When he got banned, it just sucked all of the oxygen out of the room for Anthem, and the game had no real audience on places like Twitch and YouTube. Even if the game would have gotten better in the future, it's safe to say not as many people would be exposed to it, and not as many people would be talking about it. As a result of Glad getting banned, Glad got banned in March of 2019, right after Anthem's release. Literally, the month right after launch. And to be honest, that really set the tone for the future of the game. People were willing to stick around and see where the game was going. In their eyes, if Glad saw something in it, then there had to be something there. Anthem's launch had already been absolutely terrible, but Glad getting banned was just sort of the straw that broke the camel's back for many people who were willing to give it a chance. Anyway, moving on from the silly decision to ban Glad from Anthem, the beauty of games like Destiny and Warframe is that they can change over time and become much better than they originally were. Fans of Anthem were hopeful that the same could happen to it. Given enough time, and at one point, it did seem like there was a chance for Anthem to be born again. Then, EA happened again. In May of 2020, a blog post was released on the game industry biz by Matthew Hondrahan, stating that Bioware had confirmed the existence of a small team of developers working on making Anthem much, much better than it was at release. This would be Anthem 2.0 an update that would completely overhaul all of the issues that players had with the game, and most likely add large chunks of new content into the game, while changing elements of the game's systems and progression methods so that activities would feel more rewarding. Essentially, Bioware had committed to making Anthem into the amazing game that was always hidden below the surface of its difficult development. However, by February of 2021, the Anthem 2.0 project had been cancelled. It's unclear whether it was EA or Bioware who made the choice to pull the plug, although we can assume it was a combination of the two. But developers who were working on Anthem were reassigned to work on Dragon Age Dreadwolf and other upcoming Bioware titles. This was obviously a massive blow to everyone who was passionate about Anthem. From the fans who had stuck with the game no matter what, to the developers who had put so much effort into trying to rescue Anthem and make it the great game they had always intended it to be. It's such a shame that such a brilliant concept never got the chance to really become something amazing. That being said, we can still go back and play what is left of Anthem. That's right, for a whole FNF 1997 editor paycheck of $4, I bought Anthem to replay and see what elements work well and what was the remnants of Anthem 2.0. Originally, my time with Anthem was meant to be for a series called Destiny Killers. In a style akin to the Iron Pineapple series on Souls Likes, I would go and play games that have similar elements to Destiny in some way. Most of these fell closer to roguelikes, and I do want to continue this series, so make sure you subscribe for that. But Anthem was the spearhead of them all. In my episode, I discussed the beauty of the world, the flight mechanics, and that there was still some technical issues. But the more I played for this video, the more I noticed the world was actually very bugless. A lot of the bugs people complained about were due to server issues kicking them back to the menu and stuttering during flying. But that was mostly because the game forced you to be online all the time. And we know how those EA servers are. So I played Anthem fully and... It was okay. Sometimes it had flashes of being great, but it has mostly undiscovered potential, and no amount of rose tint for the flying was going to fix that. I'll begin with what I loved. The flying, while immaculate, had some deeper mechanics than I was prepared for. I loved the barrel rolling in the sky, and the diving near water to refresh the engines. It kept me engaged. I also really loved how much of a flow entering and exiting flight was. 
especially how each suit had different animations to go with flight. I also forgot how the world was just gigantic and connected with very few loading screens and plenty of populating the world. Can you see why people were excited for the potential when the game came out looking like this? There's a level of interconnected world that most games of this kind don't get. Think of Outriders, a game that I liked more than Anthem overall, but it's filled with loading screens because the game just couldn't handle the level of technical achievement that Anthem had. I also really was getting interested in the new enemy designs and the ability-based combat, as these were portions of the base game I think everyone mostly liked. I think there was also a good amount of world building in the lore and the life of the world. Admittedly, I don't want to go too deep in the story or lore because a lot of it resided in the potential of Anthem 2.0. Lots of loose ends with buzzwords of names and places mentioned like there was a lot of sequel bait. It reminded me of fighting Crota in the first year of Destiny and hearing about Oryx through the environments and lore. I wasn't about to commit my time to something that will never exist. I like the concept of the Anthem, a concept that every single thing in the world has a sound to it that works together. Other than that, the strongholds were the best part of the game. Bosses that felt unique, mechanics that were a little bit of a step up from the rest of the game, and at the tail end of my time, there was a stronghold that was about as close to a Destiny raid as possible, and in the very early vision of Anthem 2.0 that we'll talk a bit about. We're thrown into the planet Coda, and you are a freelancer a heroic adventurer who wears a powerful exosuit to defend humanity from the threats beyond the city walls. The Anthem is about the Anthem of Creation, a powerful and mysterious force responsible for most of the extraordinary technology, phenomena, and threats of the world. We are shown in a cutscene that things were peaceful for a time, until bald Elon Musk came to wreak havoc. Now you must find the Heart of Rage and put a stop to the Xenotaph so all the enemies like Bald Elon Musk and Doctor Doom can't use the Anthem of Creation for bad. You meet this guy named Owen who might sound familiar. I know you. Okay, when's my birthday? Ah, uh, trick question. You don't like celebrating birthdays. And there will be no British voice actor betrayal here, I promise. Along the way, you trick Doctor Doom and say this line. One rusty old javelin in exchange for all those lives. That's generous, don't you think? He's trying to trace your location. I'm picking up Dominion soldiers in the area. No, there is no javelin. Get glitched. There's no way he just said get glitched. That is the There's no fucking line. way he just said get glitched. That is the there is no line. way he just said get glitched. <laughs> Then you eat testicles for a princess, I'm not joking. Then Owen decides for literally no reason to betray you and take the General Tarsus legendary javelin of Dawn. So he can live out his dream of being a freelancer? Owen then joins forces with Doctor Doom just to then still work with you. But nobody else, okay? Owen then gets beat up by Dr. Doom and gives you the part you will need to make a shield powerful enough to reach the Heart of Rage and defeat Dr. Doom. You end up fighting a larger version of the boss, but just as you think the final health bar is there for the final stand of the fight, this happens. Oh, oh, that's it. I am Anthem. Oh my God. Where the fuck did that come from? What are you doing here? <laughs> are you all right? Did you see that? How did he not Jay hear was connected that? To the what bottom. is up with her eyes? Cypher, Cypher. She knows what to do. What's she doing? I don't know. Not great. I I'm doing better than you. No. Run again. 
You got this. <sighs> Okay, so why are we like playing this off like there's not still a boss health bar? No, there's no way they're gonna end it like that. There's no way! There's no way that's it! There's no way they end the campaign like that! Then the game just ends. But not before teasing Anthem 2. The eastern border. Killed two of our team before we were able to put it down. And uh -oh. map the region on it. Ergoth. You've heard of them. What? From stories. What? Famous, but they're Wait, what? All gone. Yeah, it's safe to say why people only remember the abilities and the flight. The story was really bad. The end game was also very shallow overall. Yeah, you can earn some gear and weapons, but there's not that final place to test everything you've learned like there was in Destiny's first year with the Vault of Glass. And it's not like there's PvP to hold you over either. Anthem was by all means a vanilla experience, but I did mention the 2.0 vision and the one activity that showed me what could have been for Anthem, and that was called the Seasonal Stronghold. By my time being finished with this game and kind of burnt out already, a viewer told me to check out this thing called the Sunken Cell, and this wasn't your traditional stronghold. This was filled with bonus chests, puzzle mechanics, extra incentives for scoring higher tiers, and more loot, and a better boss than normal, albeit still not anything like a Destiny raid boss. The sunken cell was a linear chamber of floors, then swimming through the level unlocking new places every breaststroke, and loot matched the challenge. Now, I was hard carried, but this was clearly something new and different, and this tells me it was a damn shame Bioware couldn't continue this project some more. I think that had Anthem 2.0 released, people would still be playing this game in masses. Would it have been as big as Destiny? Probably not, since the third-person looter shooter MMO Lite has some others in the space. But it would definitely have a strong player base. It's clear to me that EA saw this game as an experiment to try to make a name in this genre space. And it's even more clear that EA has learned some lessons from this experiment, as they have become EA Games while EA Sports exists as a business front. EA in the future would go on to make the immensely successful Apex Legends with Respawn. But instead of using the Frostbite engine, they have now been using Unreal Engine 4 and 5 for future games, since they learned this the hard way with Bioware. For Bioware, their next game serves as a return to form from the stranglehold of Anthem. You can't just tell an RPG-driven developer to make something so different without some major issues. And Anthem is what happens when you do. EA will be taking the scraps of Anthem and using its flight to make an Iron Man game in the Unreal Engine 5, so players can finally wear the suit again. It's just so tragic it had to happen this way, that EA and Bioware leadership didn't really have a game plan, just a whole lot of dollar signs looking down a tunnel ready to collapse. I think back to all those bumps Destiny, The Division, Warframe, no Man's Sky, Cyberpunk, and more had before they became pretty great games. And it's a shame that Bioware and Anthem wasn't given the same opportunity. You may now rest upon the cobwebs and dust of a world brimming with potential. And that is the Anthem we never got. Thank you for watching this video and taking the time to be as far as you are into it. I am probably live right now on Twitch playing another Destiny killer out there or whatever interests me. Thank you all for your time, and just know I really appreciate you watching. Have a good one, everyone. Mm.